All right, I see you live. Good. All right, Paul. So we're we're live, and uh, what can we talk about? Can you guys hear that? Okay. Okay. So so it, it's it's Q and A style. So it, it, let's let's just start with how do we do this, Chris? Just start with whatever questions we have, or or do you have anything? Uh, I uh, whatever you guys want to do. We can talk about uh, any topic that uh, that I'm familiar with. And um, I've got a whiteboard if you want to go through any kind of concepts or things that are of interest uh, in that regard. Uh, whatever you guys want. Okay, we got a question. Would you mind just giving up the Right. Okay, the first request is just for uh, in introduction of, of you and, and stuff that you've done. And like, you should probably introduce Iron Router and Event in Mind, too. Okay, you, you want me to do that? Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, nice to meet everyone. I'm Chris Mather. Um, I run Evented Mind, uh, which is a site dedicated to uh, teaching programming. Um, and we have quite a few classes on Meteor and JavaScript and related technologies and, um, and uh, concepts. And let's see, in, in Meteor, I got involved with Meteor early on. And um, I helped to write the uh, or wrote the the router package uh, that a lot of people use called the Iron Router, um, and that's kind of the, the gist of it. And so our our primary goal, my primary goal with the Invented Mind, is to to help people learn these concepts. Um, so anyway, I'm excited to be here. So thanks for having me. Okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, how how closely do you work with the or New York team? So, the yeah, first, I definitely have to repeat those because I yeah, can't repeat anything. I'll, I'll repeat it. So, so the quest, first question was how how closely have you worked with the with the core team and, and like are they are they just down the street or or are you guys how 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 do you work with them is the question. Um, yeah, they are actually right down the street. Um, I go there from time to time. Um, we worked a lot close, more closely in the beginning um, than we have recently in the past year. I think as uh, as I've started to focus more of my time on teaching and on event in mind, I've had less and less time to focus on uh, sort of the, the open source and, and software development aspect of it, as people probably noted. Um, but I've spent quite a bit of time with, with their team working through designs and um, talking about um, Iron Router and, and different parts of the, the core and. Um, and I know the founders quite well, so um, yeah. So I so we we definitely have a relationship. So considering uh, someone move a little bit closer. Yeah. Or you, yeah, you can. Sorry, just so that I. Sorry, just considering the fact that I guess like Iron Router is a very uh, popular component of the Meteor. At least I'm not sure. I personally just use Iron Router. Are you saying you're a lot less involved now? So what does that mean for the future of the router itself? Are you, are there contributors? Is there plans to make sure that it keeps up with the time? And or does the core team have a plan for something else? Yeah. We're just sort of curious because this is like what the questions we have to sort of like deal with when we're trying to use all these packages. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's a totally fair question. So um, the short of it is that the router will move into core. Um, at some point, I can't speak for the core team, so I don't know what the schedule looks like. But we're in, we've started discussions on that uh, fairly recently, and um, so there'll be some kind of announcement I think coming coming pretty soon about what that looks like and how it will work. But um, the gist of it is that uh, there will be a, a router in core, and, and, with, and which parts of that come from Iron Router, and which parts are, are rebuilt, or uh, how exactly that happens is unclear. And we need to work through it. Um, so that's the, the short answer. I, I think a little bit of context to that is um, way back when, when we started the router project, I actually started that by um, I was sort of looking for a, a way to, to um, get to learn the Meteor framework better. And I really got into building packages for it and, and as I was kind of learning it in, in very deeply. And I realized that in order to build an application, you, you needed a, a router. And people, I think, at the time were using a combination of different routers. Um, there was Meteor Router from uh, from one of the community members, and then there was Backbone Router, and uh, but it all felt a little bit janky and not really integrated well with Meteor. 
So I actually started off by going to the Meteor Core team because I saw it was on their their roadmap uh, and saying, hey, you know, I think this is pretty important. Um, but they just couldn't get to it in a reasonable amount of time. So I ended up just building one. Um, and then I, I partnered with with Tom Coleman, who had written one of the other routers. And the reason was I figured if we're going to go through this process together, um, or we may as well go through the process together because it'll make the the, um, the learning easier because there's a lot of tricky concepts uh, to come up to speed with. And so it ended up just kind of becoming the, the router, but it was really never intended to kind of win or to like you know indefinitely be the router. I mean, um, we kind of did that and we, we taught classes on it and stuff because we thought that, that it was important for people to understand how it worked. Um, but but our primary thing that we do is to teach. So I want to I want to spend more time doing that. Um, and so I think that, that where this thing belongs is, is with core, and, and that's where it will be. Did that answer the question? Yep. In the meantime, by the way, I, I you know I, I feel terrible when I look at GitHub and I see all these issues that I'm on, I'm not able to keep up with anymore. And I used to be able to do it. Um, and, and now it's just literally just to run out of t hours in the day, and um, and, I, and, I, and I just can't respond to all of them. But uh, but I try my, my best, um, and and so I, I'm hoping that that we can kind of keep it going and, and, and work together to resolve some of these issues at least until uh, until until the core team does bring on the router into. Hi, um, so I've uh, I've heard of Meteor and uh, I haven't really used it. I'm more of a kind of express uh, kind of guy. Uh -huh. and, uh, I've been thinking of using Meteor or learning it for some production purposes uh, going forward. And I just I wanted to hear about your experiences uh, with using Meteor in production environments. And do you know of any large projects that are that that uh, use Meteor and use it well? Well, you know, let me start by saying this. You know, we aren't we aren't at Evented Mind Technology Evangelist. So, uh, you know, it's not we don't spend a lot of time talking about why one framework is better than another, um, or saying you know that this is the all you know purpose framework to use for everything. Um, my preference is to to teach how things work, to give approaches for for assessing problems, and to let people kind of decide for themselves. So I think, you know, with, with that said, it's not to, to jump the, to, to skip the answer, but it depends on, on what you're building. I think with every kind of system, there's there's characteristics of the system, and sometimes those characteristics will give you benefits, and they'll also cost something. Uh, so, for example, you know, to have a real-time publish subscribe system is fantastic because, especially when it's combined with a reactive user interface, because you can build these really, really rich user interfaces that update automatically in response to data changes. You kind of get all that for for free and that you don't have to write a ton of code to get it to work. And that's pretty magical. You know, but it comes at a cost in that you have to think a little bit more carefully about uh, how much uh, data is being stored in memory and how much the CPU has to work to decide, you know, what the diffs are to send down the wire. Uh, how much does that actually matter? In other words, will it, will it work in your production system? Um, it depends on the system and the kind of data and published characteristics that it has. So what I recommend for, for anyone building a system, whether it be in Meteor or in Express or anything, is, is to write a simulator or you know, figure out what, is it, what are the requirements of the system in terms of its performance characteristics, response times, um, you know, how many machines you can are required to, to run the thing and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and sort of model it out and think about the, uh, maybe even in Meteor's case, you could write a simulator, for example, and see uh, whether it can handle the load that you're, that you're expected to. So and it's maybe a little bit of a vague answer because it kind of again, depends on the system. But um, but I think for a lot of apps, Meteor is going to be fine. Uh, for, I think it has a pretty big range of, of like acceptable uh, you know, um, types of systems that it can Uh, but there's also one last thing. I mean, you know, with Express or one of the HTTP frameworks, the way we measure that is quite simple in, in most cases. They're kind of the unit, the unit of, you know, is it good or not, is the number of requests you can, you can handle per second. And with a persistent um, connection where you have state, you know, like, like a system like Meteor, where every connection just stays alive through the entire lifespan of the person being in the app. Uh, you can't just use requests per second. It's not as meaningful. 
because uh, you have a lot, you have other things like you know how, how much data is in memory, how much the CPU is working, and all that kind of stuff. So it's not quite clear yet. It's still early days for deciding what the right metrics are. Yeah. I'm not sure if you'd be able to answer that, but that's a question that, that like we've, we've been facing when working with a lot of this uh, Node.js sort of like based systems. Um, more recently, I guess a couple months ago, uh, I guess that it was in the news that the, that the Node project got forked. Uh, I mean, personally, I'm not very close to it. I don't know what that means. But if you if you have talks with the core media team, like, what does that mean? Like, the fact that a lot of the core heard that some of the core contributors on the Node project sort of like split off in some other direction. Like, is that a risk for someone who's considering, for example, uh, framework to build a system? Uh, you're, cut, you're cutting in and out a little bit. I, uh, Paul, can you repeat the, repeat the question? Go a little closer. Right, so the question was that uh, basically the, fa the news that came out that the Node.js project got forked by some of the core contributors because of some issues with the sponsors. Like I'm more looking at you to be able to give us in like closer sense what does that mean for Meteor, given that you're probably a lot more familiar with it than, than most of us here. Does that constitute a risk in general for using Meteor? In the sense that you like that Meteor would be forked, or in the sense that that oh. there's now two Node platforms. Oh, that the Node platform itself got forked. Oh, is I that, like is that a risk for someone who's like I say you build a system right now and you plan to use it for the next few years, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just we have no real sense to gauge if that's a problem or not, right? You know, my fr frankly, I haven't thought about it that much. I I, I doubt I, I know much more than you do. Um, honestly, I mean, I read Hacker News, I guess, like a lot of other people. I I think um, yeah, I thought I read that that the two projects came back together. Is that not true? Uh, where, do I, where do I look for this kind of stuff? Is there like a blog or something? Same All right, so I guess this is not a problem. Yeah, I mean, I guess I could answer it abstractly. I, I, um, I mean, I guess just like any other uh, kind of target, Meteor is going to, you know, is built on, I guess, Node.js proper, and I don't know if it works, you know, whether or not the fork would be API compatible or at what, you know, what level it would, it would ship things. So I guess the risk is a little bit unclear. Um, I mean, certainly there would be a version that Meteor would run perfectly fine on, um, you know, since they built it on, on top of Node.js. And so it, I don't think, as far as what I read, that, that, that Node.js was going away. Um, it just seemed like there was some disagreement maybe amongst the core team members. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what's the surface area of I.O. libraries and stuff that, that Meteor uses, I guess, would be another way to assess that risk. But I don't know. This doesn't seem like a real big deal to me. I have a question. Yeah. So uh, I think um, an interesting, an interesting uh, topic is server-side rendering. I'm just wondering what you, yeah. if you have any thoughts on that. Maybe you can like, tell us what the what this but the state of things are currently in, in Meteor, and you know where you think stuff might go, and what 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 am I take technically to to make that happen? Yeah. Well, uh, sure. I, I do have a, a opinions on it, very strong opinions actually. Um, but I don't speak for Meteor, so I don't know what you know their plans are, other than what they have on their, their roadmap. If I had some inside knowledge and, and they were fine with me sharing it, I would do that. But I don't. So. Um, but here's what I think of it. I, I mean. Server-side rendering, that there's, a, there's actually a, a better name for server-side rendering, which is just uh, web application. Like, this is just how the web works now, right? Um, so we've actually kind of co-opted this term and, turn, and turned it into like this new thing, server-side rendering. But that's just how HTTP frameworks have worked for many years. Uh, you send a request to the server. The server uh, takes usually a templating engine you know, um, of some sort on the server and combines the markup with data and then sends it down the wire as a string of text, um, which then gets painted to the page. And that's just how the web works. With a framework like Meteor, and, and I guess with some other frameworks as well, um, there is a, a shift whereby people said, well, wouldn't it be cool 
instead of sending down text to the wire, we, we sent down JavaScript, and the JavaScript is responsible for rendering the page. Um, and so step one is to shift the JavaScript down to the client, and step two is to run that JavaScript and have it use the DOM functions to, uh, to construct the page on the client. And one of the cool things you can do with that is you don't have to go back to the server every time you want to repaint part of the page or to render something new to the page. You can just run some JavaScript and can do it for you. And that JavaScript is already on the client or the browser. So there's a sort of performance gain that you get. Um, and arguably, it's sort of simpler to reason about creating the views. The problem with it is that there is a delay uh, in the time that it takes to get that JavaScript to the client and for the JavaScript to start executing. And there's also a delay in the amount of time it takes for the data to get from the database down the wire into the views and then rendered on into the views. And so the initial load time of the application is, is quite, can be quite slow depending upon how you, you architect it. Um, and then as you navigate around from page to page, uh, you have to subscribe to, to uh, new data sort of as you go and sort of wait for that data uh, to come down the wire. So it used to be quite a bit simpler because on the server, you know, you would just go and, and go to the server and, and get a page back. And you could make that quite fast by caching pages on the server so that uh, if you already had a version of that page rendered, you just grab it all with the data and all. So you wouldn't have to wait for the data to come down as a separate thing. Um, and we kind of broke that with the client-side rendering um, way of doing things. So that was just kind of a quick tour of, of how this stuff works. But I think what's ultimately required is you need both. Um, you need server-side rendering or, or, or just, you know, I guess we can call it server-side rendering. It's not really something new, though, I guess is my point. Um, and, and having client-side rendering is useful as well. Um, and Meteor is well-positioned to, to do that, but they have to to change some of the ways that they, the web uh, package works um, in order to make it work. And you might have to fine tune their, their uh, rendering engine so that it works uh, better on the server. Um, does that make sense? Or did, uh, are there any follow ups? Yeah, yeah, that's a great explanation. And I think what, uh, there's two different reasons why people ask about server side rendering. One is just for, for web crawlers and, like, you know, Things like Facebook. Well, that's important too. You know, SEO. Yeah, I didn't mention SEO, but it's we yeah. have a solution to that, but it's a very flaky solution. Um, I, I think that, I think it could be a lot better. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that that's solvable in other ways. Like Spiderable does sort of solve that. But but I think what you what you talked about was was the performance thing, which is which is really the the real uh, most painful thing. That's, that's the higher order problem. I think. Yeah. And you, and you can also solve that by s splitting up the app into modules in theory. Uh, so, yeah, the key is that it's not just the view; it's the data, and and it's both of those things. Um, you know, that, that eventually have to make their way off the wire. And on the server side, you know, we have very good me mechanisms for thinking about how to make that really fast. And 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 so the client part of this is is still fairly new. I think people are kind of working through it and figuring out you know, how to how to do it properly. Anybody else? Um, I think we have a question in Atlanta. Um, is, it, is, it, uh, is it better to hold uh, data context for templates within, a re within the router, or is it better to hold the data context within template helpers in media? Um. I, I'm just thinking through all the different ways to answer. I, um, you know, I think I think this comes down to how organization. I mean, you can do it any way you want, right? There's like three or four different ways. Um, but but for me, I think it comes down to how do you reason about your app over time. Um, so as the application starts to get bigger, where do you, you know where does a developer go to find stuff, and how do they figure out how things traverse through the application or how data traverses through the application? And that can make an application impossible to reason about if it's not done uh, thoughtfully enough. Um, you know, or it can make it you know, relatively easy to reason through the application as, as, even as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 
So I think one of the arguments for putting a data context into the router is that it gives you, and, and what, by the way, when we say router here, I think people get confused. Um, I, I think the, the router does is very simple. It just takes a URL and maps it to a function. That's, that's pretty much what a router does. And that's what Iron Router does. Um, but it turns out that Iron Router is supported by like seven other packages that cover different parts of the routing or the overall sort of application structure problem. So once we route a URL to a function, the question is, what do we do then? Normally, what happens in an application is that function will take some data from the database, take a view, and put the two of them together, right? And then that's what gets sent down the wire. So that data context is, you know, comes from a database. And then you sort of supply it to a template that you have, which takes the data and sort of interpolates it onto, uh, onto HTML tags, uh, and then send it down the wire. And that happens normally in, a, in something called a controller, or it could be in a route function, or in any one of those places. Um, but it's generally in one place. So I, I, I'm a little hesitant to generally like put that stuff down into the templates for anything other than a, a trivial app, because uh, it makes it hard to to find stuff over time. So to me, I think it's, in, in my, I guess, practical experience, it's easier to um, to have the view be, do what the view is supposed to do, which is just to present something, and to have the data kind of in one place where you can just go and say, oh, OK, if I need to know where all the data goes and how it goes from the database to this happens here for this page. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, there's. Diff I'm not super religious about it. I mean, I guess I'm open to, to different things. Um, and, and of course, with with Event in Mind, we'll continue to research and, and see what people are, are doing. But I'm I'm a little skeptical of the idea of just pushing everything down into the view components um, because as they sort of proliferate over time, I think it makes the system harder to change and harder to reason about. So in our app, we, we put the, the data context for the templates in, in the controller, in the route controller. And it's not the router, per se, but it's the you know, part of the, sort of the routing system. I think there's one, you know, I guess one add-on to that while I'm thinking about it is when we do get server-side rendering at some point, I think that there's an argument to be made that we don't want to have these query functions, like are the query uh, queries just strewn all over the app. It's better just to have it in one place. So when you hit the server, you make that first HTTP request to the server, and you get something back, um, that query function runs on the server. And you get some data and a view, just like you do with a regular app. But then when you get on the client, it also just runs on the client. And so I, I think there's an argument to be made that um, can I draw? Can you guys see this? Yeah, you can have something like this. So we route, uh, you know, uh, I guess you know, item ID to a function. I'll just abbreviate. And we just sort of render. Item just got find one. You know, with the ID, and then this is you know in the route function, sure, but it runs on the client as well, right? It's just all in one place, so we can see that you know for a given URL in the app, this is the uh, the data that it's going to get, and this is the uh, template that it's going to get. I just render, but imagine you're rendering a particular. So I think that, that having something like this just makes it easier to see um, how the app is organized. It's, we tend to organize our app by, apps in, in web by URLs, and I think this makes sense. Is that a, uh, a terrible tangent, or did, it, did that make sense? you got to interrupt me, Paul. That makes sense. Yeah, that was great. Uh, uh, we have a question here as well. OK. How would you scale scale uh, uh, an application to be on the single server? Uh, how how much time do you have? Um, what? Well, just you know, general strategy because uh, like I, I'm new to Meteor, so sorry if uh, this sounds uh, very simplistic and naive. Like uh, just the, that that one aspect that's kind of very unclear. Well, no, I, it's fine. Uh, let me just draw again. So. 
is this a silly thing to do, or can people see this? It seems like a like a really cool idea in theory, but I'm not sure if you can actually see. Yeah, we can yeah, we totally can. see. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, how how do you scale a web application? Well, we normally have the the app. So this is our app, and the app is a process, right? That's running on the server. So this could be uh, Meteor, it could be Rails, it could just be uh, a regular Express app or whatever. But in, in Meteor or Express, this is a Node.js process. It's, it's a Node.js process, and this process um, is what requ uh, accepts requests from um, the HTTP protocol. But in a Meteor application, the process can also uh, opens up a permanent connection. So instead of just the initial HTTP request in response, you open up a bidirectional connection with WebSockets and you keep that open through the entire lifespan of the app. And then the app will communicate with some kind of database in the background. In this case, we'll call it Mongo, which is also a process that's running on the machine. And so the way that we scale an app, whether it be Meteor or any other app, is we add more processes. So I could add another uh, app here, another Meteor process. But now the question is, how do we route traffic between these two processes? So instead of going direct now to the app, we need um, something up front, another process called a router. Now, this isn't router like Iron Router. It would be like a, um, a um, HTTP router. So, like the usual stuff, Nginx or? Uh, uh, yeah, it could be Nginx or HA proxy. In fact, I mean, a better name for this is just a load balancer, right? It's a, it's not a router. Sorry, I misused the term. It's a, a, a load balancer. And it routes traffic. So this could be HA proxy is one popular one. It could be Nginx. Uh, it could be uh, Amazon has one that comes out of the box. I'm not sure what it's actually using for the bit. And it just sends traffic back and forth between these two processes. Then we could also scale Mongo, right? Um, another thing, to do, and that's another layer of the system. So generally, the first thing you're going to do is to add more app processes. Put a load balancer in front of it. Now, the one tricky thing with me here is that these connections are stateful, right? So, so you have uh, both the initial HTTP connection, but then you have this bi-directional WebSocket connection. The problem is, if you get a new request, how does it know exactly. which one to send it to? So you need something, uh, a state, you need a stateful load balancer. Um, and so the way that's normally done is uh, you, you could put something in a, in a cookie um, to, create, to create something called a sticky session, is I guess the colloquial term. So sticky session says that when you make the initial request, the load balancer should put a cookie that says either go to app, uh, app server A or app server B or whatever you know, code you have for it. And then it'll just stay on that server for the remainder of the, 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 the session. And there's different strategies to employ whether or not um, you know, how long you're stuck to that app server. It could be a week, or it could be just until the close the browser, um, or, or any number of those things. So that's you know it's not too different than scaling any other application except for this persistent connection. Okay, uh, I know that was my pretty much question about the nature of video being stateful versus the more traditional stateless uh, nature of the web applications where you don't keep any state on the actual servers. And it's just, uh, but how do you add a caching layer somewhere in between? Like, Are there any uh, packages uh, like uh, that allow us to utilize so caching mechanism between the app uh, and, uh, say, and the load balancer? Let me come back to that uh, in a sec, because there's one more part to this that I forgot, which is that you know, where do you actually store the state? Uh, well, one, where, one place to store it is in memory. On the app, on the process app server itself. Um, so, for example, if you um, in OAuth, you know, you, you, I don't know how familiar people are in the audience with how the OAuth process works, um, but in order to make that work, you need to have some state that you store as part of the, the 
the um, life cycle of the process. And what, what we do does is it actually stores it in Mongo. Um, and, and so that and so that and then you only have one Mongo you know collection from this. Regardless of which, whichever app server you end up on, it gets that um, that seed from Mongo. So you can always push things back to Mongo and make the app servers less relevant. Um, but then there are some things that are just stored in memory. You know, like the um, like for example the um, uh, the the, the, the um, I'm losing my mind here. What is it called? The uh, cache of the, the data that you have on the client. So each, each server process is going to keep track of what's been published out to the client, but it doesn't publish the same data again. And that, for example, is stored on each app, app server process. So anyway, you asked uh, about caching. What, what kind of caching did you have in mind? Well, like Memcache, the Redis. What's the use case? Well, like in a more traditional web architecture, say I would use Redis to store session information. Uh -huh. so App server, or the database proper, or you know, like things are that uh, say one app server goes down, the other one can pick up the state of that session again from Redis database uh, because it's fast and uh, you know, everybody can connect to that quite easily. Uh, so that's pretty much uh, in real life when you have well in a hypothetical situation, you get a lot of success and uh, you have lots of traffic. Uh, like these things start uh, coming into the play, and uh, okay. so that's the part that's not kind of clear for me. Yeah, the architecture the architecture here is 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 a, is a bit different. Uh, I, so the use case you mentioned was for session. Um, so you know um, to, to to just repeat my understanding of it. Um, so imagine that you have a regular you know Express app or a Rails app or something like that, and uh, and you can store you know session information in a um, in a in a, in a cube like database like Redis or, or even in the database itself. Uh, like Postgres or Mongo, and then every time a request is made, we can we can associate the request with an ID that we store, and then from that ID, we grab the uh, session data out of the database. Or that's kind of the, the idea, of right? Um, and with Meteor, it's a little bit different because first of all, you have a persistent connection with the app server. Second of all, the app server is running a, a protocol that Meteor invented called DDP, and DDP is um, a combination of client and server software and a wire protocol, in other words, the messages that get passed over the wire and what they look like. Um, and so the DDP server is kind of operates as a, a session server, if you will. Uh, so what you just described is kind of already accounted for by the DDP server that Meteor provides. And so I think over time they have some plans for allowing you to really easily scale the DDP server separately from the other server, which is the HTTP server, um, or other parts of, of, of Meteor. Um, so I think the, the idea generally is to, that, that um, Meteor wants to be able to take each parts of its, of its app stack and separate it out so that each, each can be treated separately. Um, but in this case, I don't see the need why, why you would need to have Redis as a separate thing, because um, the Meteor software already kind of does it. I, I realize that some of these concepts can be pretty weird and complex, especially if you've never heard of any of this stuff before. So I apologize. Well, no, I heard about this stuff. Just I'm um, uh, like uh, I'm well familiar how well traditional web apps are scaling. It's just the meteor that kind of puzzles me a little. But uh, it's well, there's actually like, we're kind of looking like one big monolith. But I understand what you're saying. So, uh, yeah, and, and inside of this app process, there's actually right now a couple of different things. Like there's the HTTP server that's running, and then there's also a DDP server that's running. All in the same process, and um, you can go and actually look at this in the source code. If you just look at the packages, you'll see like an, a web package that's an HTTP server, and then you'll see a DDP package that's the DDP server. So like that, over time, you'll be able to pull this out as a separate thing. And, that is, and, and this is what we consider really to be session. You know, what's what stays with the uh, the client through the lifespan of their connection to the application. Yeah, I'll, I'll have a look. Thank you. I fear I can't have people with that. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Huh? Sorry. Do you create additional uh, additional application servers, like processes, 
right? Does that also create additional DDP or corresponding DDP of processes as well? Um, I think, I, let me make sure I understand the question. So if you add more. The picture that you did before, uh, you had basically process one, and you said if we want to scale, we can add uh, additional app processes. Yeah. And then you basically said that we have the HTTP process, and we also have the DDP process as well. Uh, so, oh, sorry, yeah. They're not currently uh, independent processes. So right now, the the, uh, uh, the HTTP server is a, like a piece of software. Imagine it like um, uh, a script, you know, that's running. But it's part of the Meteor process. Oh, okay. So it's all what? So when you create multiple, you get the other ones as well. Yes. Right now, you'll just get uh, you get an HTTP server and you'll get a DDP server. You, you by the way, you can move the HTTP server. Uh, interestingly. So this, these are all just packages. And so if you wanted to, you could say, like, remove the web package, and then that would go away. You could remove the DDP package as well, and that could go away. So this is all pretty modular. Um, but there's no way, well, actually, that's not true. I mean, if you wanted to, you could actually do this yourself, I guess, uh, creating a process that doesn't have the, uh, H, the web package installed. But it's a little cumbersome. So I think what most people do is, um, they just have a Meteor process, and it's running the HTTP server and the DDB server as part of the same process. Questions? So, what's up? Lana? Hey, how's it going? So, um, I don't know if you can see me. So, would you yeah. recommend um, putting routes into smart packages? Would you recommend that that's a good way to organize uh, applications? Uh, you know, using uh, uh, creating a dependency with Iron Router in your smart package, and just putting your routes in there. I, is that something you've seen done, or recommend? Just curious. Well, I don't know about a general rule of thumb. Um, I I favor um, two things, I guess. I, I favor the uh, simplicity of reasoning about a system, and so. Uh, I don't like uh, just pulling things out and hiding them just for the sake of it, um, especially if it um, doesn't help in, in, in people understanding how things are working. So, you know, for example, if, if every route, as an extreme example, was in its own package, that would be extremely confusing, you know, to navigate an application. So, I, I think, that, you know, in most cases, for most apps, I'd recommend that you put all that stuff in one place, um, which is in the app. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's up there. Okay. In some cases, that's to pull it out. You know, like if you have an admin module or something that is like a contained piece of functionality. Um, and the way that that is normally done in, in other frameworks, like in Express or Rails, is you can mount a package or mount an app at a particular URL in the app. And we don't have that ability yet with Iron Router or with Meteor, but uh, hopefully it will come at some. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Uh, did you build the event of mind on media as well? Uh, did, did, you, did I build the event of mind on media? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So when I first started event of mind, the, the, the less esoteric story, um, I actually started it like two or three years ago, or three years ago, and I put up a JavaScript course. And um, you know, I had it all wired up, and I did everything, and, and I didn't sell. Uh, I think I, I actually sold one copy of the JavaScript course total. And uh, so I sh I said, oh, geez, this isn't going to work. Um, and, and I just kind of shut it down for a while. And that original uh, thing was a Rails app. And then I came into contact with you here several months later, um, maybe six or seven months later. I did a bunch of other projects. Uh, and then ended up kind of rebuilding it and learning Meteor at the same time. So, um, yeah, it became a kind of, a kind of symbiotic thing. Um, but, yeah, I mean, over time, though, our, our goal at Event of Mind is to, to teach how things work. And so for that, it doesn't, I think, require that, you know, we be... Um, I love Meteor because I think it's a great teaching tool, and I think it has some really cool ideas and concepts in it. But we want to teach, a, you know, how lots of things um, across media and, and other technologies as well. So I think you know, what we end up building with the back end and what we use should really be tied to what we teach, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of things. So now it's not on media, right? It's on media. Yeah. Oh, it's on media. Yeah. Uh, can you also say what was the biggest challenge that you met while building the app on Meteor? Like, like a bit of wine. If you had any, like, you probably had some challenges, right? Yeah. Uh, well, there's the challenges of just building any app. I mean, they're, they're, I think that, that uh, but the particular challenge here were probably related to mostly to the fact that it was such an early framework that there were, like there was no router, for example. So I ended up kind of building a lot of components that I probably otherwise would have had to spend time on. Um, that was probably the hardest part. And then you know there were some things like uh, about learning how to scale the processes and, and that kind of thing that was kind of I, I don't know if it's any specific. I think if anyone who stands up a production is kind of going to go through this any experience with any framework, and I kind of did it. Fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was trying to think of like what would be specific to, to Meteor. I guess one one issue is just like how do we organize the files and stuff? Because you know, there's no there was no real in that, so uh, we just kind of came up with a way to do it. We tried a bunch of different ways and finally settled on something. But I think I think the core team would have some recommendations. Hey, so uh, I have a question surrounding like nested routes. So I know you say you're not really working on the router so much anymore, but like um, you know, I've run into this a few times where I wanted to create a nested route where like I want some of the same subscriptions and you know, going down to kind of like a child route, and uh, I haven't really seen a good way to do that. Have you thought about it, or have you seen anyone solving that sort of problem? Um. Yeah, I mean, well, there's a you know a bunch of different framework appro or different approaches out there in the world um, that I've seen. Um, I, I'm not 100 percent familiar with all of them, but I, I guess one of them that you're bringing up is this idea of kind of. Um, I mean, it's basically all, all around the idea of sort of inheritance, right? Like you have um, maybe an inherited route, or like something that is a child of another route, um, or it's or it's a deeper nesting. Um, and I guess the way to do that right now in, in Iron Router is with, with inheritance. But it, it, admittedly, it's a little bit difficult because you can't control file load order very precisely. So it's a kind of information at this point. Um, but yeah, this idea of like reusability and organization is something that has been thought about in many different contexts for a long time. I, I think inheritance is a way to achieve it. Um, Mixins is a way to achieve it. Um, there's probably some other approaches as well. Great, thanks. Yeah. I, I, I think arguably, like, with Iron inheritance adds a lot of complexity, I think, because not everyone understands how inheritance works or why they need it or should they even use it. So it is kind of arguably simpler just to map a URL to a function and be done with it. Um, so I don't know. It, it, it's a trade off of the uh, complexity that is. Um, um, Simplicity in terms of understanding you know, exactly what's happening um, for a beginner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have another question on the way. Sure. <laughs> I feel like this is like a confession booth or something. <laughs> Come up to the. Okay, so we're putting together a favorite package uh, for the ride, and uh, I've kind of the call to the list. And we have a couple. I'm of sorry. Are going to either call or have to repeat the question, or, or can you speak up? I can't hear. Okay, so we're putting together a package, uh, a CMS package for the media called uh, Orion, and we have come uh, up. We made a few instances where Iron Router is not. Uh, uh, behaving the way we want it, and uh, so we. I have a couple of questions here relating to uh, your package. Uh, the first one is this. compared to something like Flow Router that is coming out now. Uh, what is your take? Do you say continue using Iron Router or for all to migrate to something like Flow Router? And the other question that I have also is this. the packages that you have that are used on top of Iron Router. 
uh, like the one for Google Analytics, um, the one for SEO done by Lookback. Uh, some of these uh, packages, when you use them together, they're incompatible. So, for regarding the plugin, so uh, how regarding maybe like tutorials to clear up some of those incompatibilities regarding the plugin? Are you willing to like uh, help clarify that? How we can write one write a package for SEO? And what is existing right now is it's not uh, it doesn't do what we want. So. I hope I'm fine. Well, you know, I think that um, we all kind of go through this process of uh, first you know, realizing that we have some problem that we want to solve, uh, and then two is and then finding someone who has solved that problem and then using their thing, um, and, and that works to a point. And inevitably, though, you know, the thing that, that doesn't solve it exactly the way that you want it to be solved, or um, or it doesn't quite fit the use case, or you know, the, or something like that. And then eventually, all of us kind of have to gain just more understanding about how the primitives work, about how the uh, underlying parts of a system work. And if you're willing to just sort of bite that bullet and do that kind of upfront, and to start to learn more and more about how, just how things work, these things become more of just a tool that you can use instead of you know being um, you know you sort of, sort of Holding you back because, like, oh, I need to this thing from over here, or this thing from over here, or I'll just build it myself. So, you know, the question if I'm going to use something is, is it actually going to save me significant time? So, for like any package that I use, I'm going to audit the source code, right? And I'm going to look at it and say, okay, this is how I would approach the problem. Um, and will this actually save me time? Have they, have they done it sort of in a way that's sort of exactly in line with what we need it to do? So I think what, that's sort of my philosophy, I guess. Um, you, know, you asked a specific question about router, blue router versus blue router, um, and then what to do, like when you run into one of these situations. Is that uh, is that a fair characterization of your question? Yes, I'm asking regarding flow router, right, and what you have right now. I know I know Iron Router is very mature, right? Yeah. And yeah. the other one is a newer pack, is a newer uh, uh, package. Uh, because we're trying to put together CRMs, we're trying to, right now we use iron, iron router. Yeah. Uh, but uh, for things like SEO, when we want, we kind of build that bit on your package, right? We find out what is existing out there. Like we get in the plugin, for example, right? We, we, we uh, documentation there, right? If you could do a little bit of tutorial, it, it helps because what they what is out there right now, they kind of incompatible. If you use uh, a mod, if you combine those plugins. Let's say you use the Google Analytics, you use the, uh, the SEO from Lookback or any of those other ones, uh, then you know all hell breaks loose. Well, look, I mean, I think I haven't done a deep look at, at Flowrider other than I, I know that it exists. Um, I think all of this in, in a couple months time is going to be moot point because there's going to be a router. In the world. Um, but for now, I mean, there's been a lot more hours that have gone into Iron Router, um, so. I, I suspect that it's going to be a more complete set of packages um, at this point, just simply based on the amount of time and, and, and effort that's gone into it. Um, but I think also I see a lot of confusion in the community about like what you know things like is it a simple router or is it a complex router or um, it, it's just kind of not right because there's there's actually like when you think of Iron Router there's like eight packages, so it's not just a router, it's it's all these other packages that the router depends on. Like for example, the ability to render templates and pass them in data context, you don't get that out of the box with Meteor. So we had to build something to do that. And we call it iron layout, iron dynamic template. And the router is actually quite straightforward. I mean folks and all these kinds of things that people learn how to use, but if you just look at what it does, it's it's maps a URL to a function. That's that's it. And one of the complex parts of it, I guess, is that that function is reactive. So there, there was, the, the, I think that causes a lot of confusion. Uh, and, and Flowrouter, I think, made the choice to to make it not reactive, and, and I think that was, that's probably a good, good decision. Um, but you know, for Iron Router, we could make it not reactive too. It would just be removing one line, or two lines that are reactive. Um, in fact, you could make it not reactive uh, yourself quite simply. So. 
But then you're creating that complexity for you know when you want it to be reactive, you now need to manage the reactivity yourself. So, um, but I, you know sometimes I show people with Iron Router if you don't want to use that, just jump right down to there's another package called Iron Location, which is what manages the URLs. Like the, when the URLs change, it just reruns a function. That's all it does. So you can actually do this yourself by creating a computation. I'll show you right now in three minutes how to use a variable You know how to create a computation? Yes. Um, maybe the black is actually easier to read. <laughs> So you say factor dot model one, right? And, and then we pass it the function that we want to run. Right, and you agree that this one will rerun anytime we validate this computation here. Now inside of here, you call a data function that can automatically have a rerun, and one of those we can do is the same location called low is equal to iron dot location dot get. And then do whatever you want. And every time the URL changes, this function will run. So if you want something super, super simple, just use this. Um, doesn't get much more easy than that. You know, on top of that, if you wanted to just use um, this in combination with being able to define routes, you know, you can go and kind of customize the higher level router um, as you see fit. But I just, you know, take a look at the code and um, read through it. It's not, it's not terribly difficult. It's just once you know where things live. Okay. Thank you. A little question. Uh, it's not a question. Just like, a, well, maybe it's a question. <laughs> Are you considering just maybe adding an option of reactivity to each route? Like maybe just like pass reactive true false, and like by default it will be true. Just uh, say like it's probably one line or anyways. So it's just like when we do these things, it's probably gonna get messy with the time, especially when the project grows. So we do all these <coughs> kinds of hacks, and uh, it's not a hack actually, but it, it just like. Adds complexity, uh, uh, complexity to the app. So maybe it would be really nice if you just add the reactivity, like false option or something, to the to each route or to global uh, duration of the router. Yeah, it would be really nice. I agree. I actually think the more that I spend time on it, I think it's the right decision not to have the uh, route functions be reactive at all. At all by default. Um, I, I, I think it can be confusing to have a function rerun man, kind of seemingly randomly multiple times and not really be able to reason about why that's there. Um, I think that's a confusing topic. I think another one is that these hooks ended up being kind of an idea for being able to extend the router. But it ends up creating a lot of confusion for people um, because they're not sure, like, am I supposed to do it this way or this way or which function should I use? And it really, like, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You can use one function. Um, so maybe we should have just done it that way. But uh, you know, we basically, like I said, have just a URL mapped to a function. And it just happens that that function is reactive. Um, but you know, the reactivity call, right? You know how to do that? Well, just we understand that. But uh, the problem is majority of the like new users or new developers don't know these things. And uh, when they don't have the option, they just switch to another one, like Flow Router, which does the exact same thing, just not reactive, right? Yeah, the problem with that is that you know, then you'll run into a couple of things that probably they haven't solved yet. Um, and it's easy to pretend like it just don't exist. But I just, they haven't been working on this problem long enough. Um, there's a, th this is very complex. It took us a year. So if something's springing up in a month, I mean, they, they probably did, like, you know, the, there's a bunch of other things that they haven't looked at yet, I would suspect. 
but that doesn't mean that it would be better in, in the router. Um, I, I mean, I think it should. I, I think you're right that the default should be able to not be active. I think that actually has quite a bit. Uh, but I think what, what this is really going to be is a discussion that we have with the core team about what we've learned um, and, and how they can do it better um, when, when they create a router that's part of, of, of core. So I think instead of like, like a novel, which, which is going to be like the next community solution, for this particular part of the ecosystem, it's going to be core. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, this is like a, a little bit of a question. It's not specific to Iron Router, but in general. Um, we're looking at like using sort of like the on-prem framework, right? And so I can pick up a bit and it's popping out. The, the front-end framework that you would want to use with the Meteor app, and obviously like, you know, Blaze is the one that sort of comes out of the box with Meteor. But let's say, for example, you wanted to use uh, something like uh, React or even Polymer, which is still in its infancy. Because how do the concepts that Media already implement compared to something like the Shadow DOM and what components Polymer, and does does that mean that they're they're going on like Meteor has picked a certain way of doing it, and what does that mean if you like plan on later on to use some of the stuff that comes out of Polymer and version that they can release? Yeah, I think one of the interesting things that's happening is that you put people in like uh, two characters on opposite sides of the world and have them work. So I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, uh, just one second. Yeah, you can go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. But I, I said one of the interesting phenomenon of, I guess, I don't know what this one falls into, but like if you take two people and put them on opposite sides of the world around the same time period, and you have them work on something, it's actually probable that they'll come up with something similar. And, um, and oftentimes you see inventions happen this way, right? Where the, the invention is simultaneously invented in different places around the world, and they're very kind of similar. So um, I think at the time that Meteor started working on on Blaze, it was not clear that Facebook was working on it and, and solving a similar kind of problem, but in a different way. Um, so that was just kind of an interesting take. I, I think React is pretty awesome, by the way, and I think that they. Um, they need to take the right approach, I think, with reactivity, which is to kind of push it down into the re-rendering process. But it's, it's not something you think about when you're working with React. It just kind of happens. Um, the same thing with, like, I guess the, the, the polymer that, of course, they're taking as well is just to improve performance as well as establish it and solve the same problems, right? But it seems like yes, how, would you, how would you balance both of these and that with me? Or, I mean, I'm not sure how close you are with the well, core. Well, the first thing is they're not all the same. So they they, diff, they have like any system like I've been talking about. You know, they they're going to have different characteristics and pros and cons, um, and there's going to be you know potentially integration cost and all that. Um, you know, React, for example, does a a, a a diffing. They use a diffing algorithm, and so um, you can go watch on Event of Mind how this works. Just watch the free intro video on React. Um, but they look at both DOM, DOM trees and they go one by one, and they see what's different. And then they repaint based on that. So that makes server-side rendering actually quite quite easy to do and work very well with client-side rendering. It's also much easier to reason about, uh, I think, from, from the user's perspective. Um, so they, they do that quite well. Now, working that into a Meteor app is, is uh, pretty easy, because Meteor is uh, very modular. So you can pull out parts of, of Meteor and put it in other parts. But you have to know a little bit about what you're doing you know, in order to do that. Um, so then there's some things about React that I think some people might not like. Uh, for example, um, React's philosophy is that your JavaScript and your HTML should be in the same file. And it's easier to see the, the, the connections between you know, the event handlers and helpers and stuff if it's all right in one place. The Meteor philosophy is that you, know, you should separate these things. So it kind of depends on, I guess, your personal taste. What I would do is learn more about all of them. Uh, I would learn about these approaches to problem of getting, you know, rendering things on a page, so that you as an engineer can make these choices based on um, real education and based on knowing how things work instead of just, you know, taking some marketing guy's word for it. Um, and I have a, sort of like a, another question that's a little bit unrelated to blog, which is uh, using Meteor to build uh, sort of like actual, sort of like 
applications on the phone rather than having a full browser. I'm sorry, you're, you're just below the threshold of, of the mic picking you up. Okay, sorry, I was talking about the fact that if you wanted to use Meteor to actually build a new, like a phone application rather than like a web application, do you have any sort of like uh, comments about about that with respect to routing and that kind of stuff? Because I mean, this seems it's advertised as so sort of like where phone gap phone gap could do Meteor be able to sort of do where you can kind of like build a single app and deploy both on on mobile and on the web. Or is that sort of like a, not as good as it sounds? Um, well, I, first of all, I haven't done it. So uh, we should start with that. So I, 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 I'd be speaking mostly from a philosophical perspective. Um, I haven't tried the, uh, I haven't done any, any classes or videos on the Cordova stuff for me here. So I only know about it from reading the documents. I helped them make it work with the router as well, um, but um, I guess the, you know the holy goal of things is you know to have one framework to, to meet them all, right? And then you just write once and it just works everywhere. Um, historically, that's been very difficult to get completely right. Um, usually, there's edge cases or like things that you need in the native platform or vice versa. So again, with all these things, it kind of depends on specifically what your requirements are. Um, so I mean, what I'd recommend is trying trying it out, right? But you should kind of do it from an educated perspective, you know. So you know, like you should know if you're going to write this in a native app. Have you built a native app? Do you know what that feels like and what that looks like? Um, have you worked with building the, uh, you know, a, uh, a mobile app in, in Meteor and, and sort of what what does that development process look like? Is it is it, is it actually end up saving you time? Um, I, so I would try to kind of try both ways. I'm a little skeptical of a one size fits all solution. Um, I, cause I, cause I think that it's, I just never seen it work that well. Thanks. Anyone else? <coughs> well, okay, yeah, so actually, I have something. Um, you mentioned earlier something about, um, there was a question about state in uh, being stored with your route versus being stored in template, and your answer was something about that it's harder to reason about. I was wondering if you could uh, maybe expand on that. And, and I'm thinking, because there's something really interesting that, that React is doing. A lot of people are really interested in the idea of components, and React has, uh, they I don't think it's out yet, but they've started talking about their, uh, their data fetching framework, uh, Relay. And so they, they've got they've got like a component, the data that a component needs being specified with the component, and that seems to be like a good idea. I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. Yeah, you know, I, I think Paul, I need, I need to experiment with that and see. I, I, I'm I'm skeptical of that approach, um, but you know, maybe there's there's um, if I built an app that way, maybe I I, I could be convinced. I, I think though that what what happens. When you have stuff strewn all about, like let's say you've got a hundred, you know, hundred components. Like on one of our pages, we might have literally hundreds of templates, right? And if I've got to go through a hundred different files to figure out like what data is on a page, um, it makes reasoning about the application impossible. I mean, for all intents and purposes, right? So you might have some kind of tool that could just kind of show you all at once, like what, you know, what data is is this going to? But let's say you want to solve the problem of optimizing. The, um, the speed you know, in which a page loads. And part of that optimization is understanding what data needs to be on the page. Well, now, instead of like treating that as one problem, it's a thousand problems, because you have to look at it across all the different you know, subcomponents that are, that are on there. Um, so I think there's something nice about separation of concerns, um, whereby you don't have to think about a thousand problems. You think about one problem, which is the data that's on this page, and, and how does it get, you know, get there. Now, with that said, I, I, I haven't looked too much at React's um, philosophy um, around uh, the data framework that we're making, so I have a note to do a bunch more research on that, and so maybe my thinking will evolve uh, in, in the future. Anybody else? Yeah, we've got another one here. So, can we 
which he just raised a uh, good sum of money a few days ago. And I know they're talking about um, focusing on uh, integration with stuff like React and uh, other uh, other frameworks. I personally, I use uh, Famous, and I don't know if you if you had anything regarding Meteor trying to officially support that integration. Um, sorry, whether yeah, they famous. support Famous? Yeah. I don't understand the question, I guess. Okay, so with the money they raised yesterday, when I was reading on TechCrunch, and they were talking about they're going to be uh, using part of that sum to expand uh, the integration with third party uh, uh, frameworks, like, uh -huh. uh, like uh, React and you know, uh, what have you there. So personally, I use Simon, right? Uh, because I believe uh, when it comes to mobile, uh, they, make it, they make it work. Because Dome, as we know, is slow on mobile, and that's why web apps don't, don't do that. They're not very performant there. But what I'm asking is, do you know if Mitchell is have any plans, any official plans towards FEMO? I, you know, I don't speak for Meteor. I'm not sure, honestly. I, I, I wish I could tell you, um, but I don't sit in their product meetings. I don't. Um, the, the only uh, sort of official interaction I have with them is if there's um, something, you know, program that we're doing or uh, sometimes we've done design sessions in the past and that kind of thing, but uh, I, I can't speak for them. You, you have to you know, post a question on the core discussion and, and, and see kind of what, what they say. I know they're, they are they're generally pretty open about posting their stuff on their roadmap and, and, what, and, and, and discussing how they, they feel about things. They also are pretty good about creating hack pads where they just kind of have brainstorms on stuff so you can get some better insight into how they're thinking about things from that. So that's a big, because right now, uh, uh, Meteor, because someone was asking uh, regarding mobile app, and uh, just the way Dome works with mobile, uh, doing all that rendering and, and redrawing and all, everything that goes on there, it, it's not performant. So uh, anybody that, that, if we want to have that native feel, I just feel you know, uh, Simos has to embrace uh, Simos. Uh, I think if the marriage made it right. That's not that's my take. Maybe you might be right. <laughs> I hope I am. That might be it for questions. How about the Atlanta guys? <laughs> I think that's probably it. Yeah, I think we're good. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Chris. All right. All right. Thank Keep you, Paul. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, Atlanta. Thank you, Kara. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Tom's demoing a uh, chart tool that he built. Uh, in terms of a uh, presentation to watch. Yeah, we'll use this one. Uh, you know what? Maybe that works. <laughs> I think that'll be fine. Maybe you can explain it on screen. That totally works. Thank you. One minute, just to connect to the globe network because everything is quite difficult. Just while Tom's setting up, does, does anybody have any announcements or anything? Okay. We've done maybe 80% of the things that you need to do on the back end. And we keep on adding stuff. And 
uh, we'll make it look bad. So you're talking about using Famous and uh, Meteor to, to do the rendering. There is a package. Have you, have you tried to get around that package that sort of integrates the handlebars along with Famous? Uh, yes, I, it does not. It doesn't look very good. But I was wondering if you actually had a chance to to work on it. Yes, the one done by uh, Gadik. Uh, it's actually very good, uh, famous view. Uh, it, it makes it uh, way better. Way, you know, way better. Better. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot easier. Isn't it? You don't have to break it. But so the thing, documentation is not that great. So. But it, true. And, and, and I've been working with him, we kind of uh, put up uh, more like a uh, snippet uh, site where you can have snippets and documentation and stuff like that. Are these guys in Toronto or, or are you working remotely? Sorry. I will work remotely in, in Israel and I'm here and uh, and other guys are, you know, they're relevant. I'm not going to take a bunch of your time. No, no, please. <laughs> so, but, but I feel famous is the way to go. For front end, you can get it. If you want to have an agency, then you will feel famous. But, if you build it, doing the back end, you're the right. No need reinventing the wheel. Everything that, and we're very, very uh, welcome. You know, we want more people to come. You know, uh, if you have questions, anything, we'll, we'll, we'll hold your hands. You know, and um, hopefully you're able to build. The, the, the goal is to allow you to be able to build enterprise apps. Something from simple to 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 you know, complex apps. Things that is not really possible today with each other. I mean, it's possible, but you have to do a lot of better, you know, uh, we're trying to solve that problem. And uh, I know somebody was talking about radius and scaling, you know, and that's something I wish they, they, they pushed in a little bit more regarding uh, scaling the, the mission on the back end because uh, those are the kind of things that we'll, we'll try to deal with as we continue to make Orion work. You know, that's it. Thank awesome. You. Can you present Orion next time? Uh, sure. <laughs> yes. Sure. So, hello, I'm Tom. Uh, I'm a graphics editor at Globe and Mail. I hope for the sake of my job in 10 years that you all know what Globe and Mail is. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, this is a, hopefully a very quick talk. I've done this talk to a lot of journalists, but never to developers. So, I apologize if it's kind of like puppy talk to you guys and you understand everything I'm talking about. But, you know, sometimes when I'm saying, oh, and then it makes a connection to a server, people stop and they ask me who's playing. So, uh, basically, uh, I'm a graphics editor, so what does that mean? That means I work on data visualization and I work on data journalism on a daily basis. So uh, that means I'm making a lot of charts, a lot of charts and a lot of maps. So uh, unfortunately for all of us, charts are a real pain. Uh, they're really, really difficult to make uh, or make properly anyway. Uh, and uh, our volume is insane. I don't know uh, what you guys think. Uh, a team like the Global Mail's graphics team would look like, but we're only five people uh, for an office of 500 people. Uh, and we have three editions a day on the tablet. We have hundreds of thousands of papers every day, millions of visitors a month. So it's a lot of volume. And that translates to basically the maximum carrying capacity that we have right now, which is about 20 charts in print daily, and probably about double that online. So we have to support those charts uh, across uh, the web, so mobile and desktop all our apps, and there's a lot of them, and print, of course. Uh, and unfortunately for us, data requires uh, a human touch. You can't just drop a data set in and hope that it'll make sense. You have to interpret it, you have to understand it, you have to translate it for readers who do not have the full context of you know, the 13 pages from StatScan that you just read to make that chart. Uh, right now, uh, all our charts are made, or up until now, all our were, charts were basically made by hand. So they would take about, 45 minutes from uh, having nothing to talking to the editor, talking to someone in production, make, getting the data, making the chart, showing it to an editor, getting it approved, getting it back into production, and then finally submitting the, uh, all, making all the versions for all the different platforms and then getting it done. So that's a crazy amount of time when you have eight hours a day to report the news. Uh, 45 minutes is a huge time sink, especially considering that like all of you here, we have a lot of meetings every single day, and you basically have to find time to work around your meetings. Uh, and of course, responsive, making responsive charts really sucks. It's terrible. Uh, recently, I made a chart that had uh, seven different sizes, seven different dimensions, video, desktop, mobile, because mobile web has to do everything has to be bigger, app mobile web, it's just it's a disaster. So very, very difficult to make. 
this is an example of a chart that I made last year, all, all done by hand. You can see my name at the bottom. Uh, and this chart took an hour, an hour and a half. I had to go into the Bloomberg terminal that we have in the office, pull the data, draw this chart, make sure it made sense, talk to the writer. It's, it's difficult. And even small things like uh, the number of ticks, these guys, these lines, the number of lines here, that all has to be proper and counted. So if you look at something like this, as I did when I first started working at the Globe a year ago, and I would draw charts like this, and at the end of the day, I would sit there and think, this really sucks. Uh, I don't want to be doing this in a year. I don't want to be making charts by hand in a year. This is ridiculous. There has to be a way to automate this. So we tried to find a way to automate it. We spent some time. Uh, we sat down and we said, OK, well, uh, there's a big redesign coming. We have to prepare for that. There's going to be literally a chart on every page every single day. So that's doubling our output from Windows right now. And we, I'm, uh, there's just not the capacity. No one can do that. It's not possible. So uh, we tried to pick uh, the base technologies that we needed. So we picked Meteor, uh, of course. Uh, we're using D3.js, which I assume some of you are probably familiar with. Uh, we're using Gulp to uh, build this monster application because it's a, just a Frankenstein right now. Uh, WK can the PDF, which is a, a WebKit-based binary that actually converts HTML to PDF on the fly. <laughs> and materials, hard work, blood and sweat, all the usual stuff. So. Uh, this is an interesting project because it's not an external project, it's not an external facing project. So our requirement list is totally different from anything uh, that I have ever built, or uh, I assume most of you have probably built uh, if you're working on client side work. So uh, things, the number one priority for us was brand, brand and typesetting, getting the chart to look like a proper chart. If you put it into the newspaper and it looks like a, a dog, a blind dog made it, you know, as it was driving drunk down the street, then it's not, it's not gonna pass. It has to be better than that. Uh, our user base is not tech literate. They're not uh, familiar with uh, web apps. They're not familiar with uh, coding at all. They're not familiar, they're, they're not gonna think in the same logical way that you guys are used to thinking. And uh, we have to design for that. Uh, uptime, because this tool is gonna be used to produce all of our print charts, uh, we basically need 99% of time. There's no way around it. It can't just sit, uh, like uh, Chris was talking about earlier, single process, single database, and that's it. Because if something goes down, then the business section has two pages to fill at six o'clock, an hour before deadline. It's not gonna work. Uh, we also need to worry about archiving. Uh, everything we do is archived for many, many reasons. Uh, and uh, if we were generating a chart automatically, we didn't want it to be created and then disappear, and then just totally uh, go away and be totally unfindable in the future, including the data. And of course, apps, web, print, video, social media, uh, all of those things. And again, brands, no aerial, no comic stands, none of that bullshit. So, things we didn't care about. <laughs> Speed, <laughs> browser support, code review and testing. None of these things that were pro probably the most core things in all of development, we don't care about any of those things. Our, our app can take five seconds to load on a computer. I don't care, it's fine. It's only internal, uh, it doesn't matter. Browser support. We can literally tell every single person using this thing, you're only using the latest version of Chrome and that's it, and walk away. So it's, it's, a, it's beautiful. It's been a lot of fun to find out the people who are still using i7 and i8 in our office and tell them, okay, just let me just drag that into the trash can for, okay, there we go, that's good. Uh, and, we don't care about uh, backwards compatibility for shimming uh, old JavaScript. Uh, we don't care about any HTML4 support. We don't care about any of that stuff. It's all CSS3, HTML5, uh, ES5. I was pushing for ES6, but then that's a bad idea. No. So why Meteor? Uh, why not? Uh, it's fun. Uh, I wanted to learn something new. Uh, I'd never used Meteor before, or honestly really built like any kind of production web app, so that was an interesting opportunity. Uh, I had seven weeks with one other person to build this thing from scratch and get it into production and get it live. Uh, and Meteor, when I first saw it well, a year and a half ago, it just didn't seem like it was ready for any of this kind of stuff, and uh, when we started, Meteor was at 1.0, so we, were, we thought Meteor was, it was ready, we could finally use it. And uh, I should have said it wasn't gonna do this thing in Rails because that would suck. 
I mean, I like rails, but no. So I'll just walk you guys really quickly through what the truck tool looks like, and you tell me what you think. I guess I'll, I'll hold this. Do this or something. OK, uh, hold this. So this is basically, I'm actually VPN to the Globe Network right now. So this is actually the tool as it is in production today. Uh, so just to give you an example, I think I have some data ready to go. There we go. So I'm just pasting in raw CSV data here. But it also takes uh, Excel data, um, just copying data from Excel or copying data from Google Docs, because that's just TSV, so it's not that different. Uh, it requires a slug, which in our case is just uh, the name of the story folder. So I'm just going to make up a, a name that people will probably be questioning in the morning. Uh, and once you hit create, you get this uh, page with all of these options. Let me just make this bigger so you guys can see what's going on. Okay. So uh, here's my data. Uh, here's my dates. And basically, I think it's go ahead and reformat. Oh, that's not right. Just ignore that. There we go. And just reformat stuff and start playing around with the chart. And it's going to draw everything in D3 automatically. Uh, this project is actually not one project, but two projects. Uh, there's the interface, which is all Meteor, and then there's a library that we built on top of D3, which actually draws all the charts, because we actually need those to work on the web when we uh, serve these uh, charts into production. So what happens is, uh, and I'll show you, I can show you guys in a second if you like, uh, I have uh, two folders. I have a front-end folder and a back-end folder, and whenever I edit anything in the front-end folder, any of the D3 stuff, it just automatically gets copied over and paste it into the back end. So that's why we use Gulp <laughs> to run Meteor. It isn't telling it's not pretty, but it, it works. Uh, we're using, again, like, you know, HTML5, like, fuck HTML4, whatever kind of stuff. These are content editable fields, so you can just type in whatever whatever you want. So we'll just put in a headline. Uh, you can add a source pretty quickly. Uh, you can rescale things uh, dynamically. So say I want to start at, no, that's not uh, say I want to start, uh, I want to end this at 4,500. I can just do that, and it'll automatically rescale the chart. So this is where the reactivity comes in. I use a D3 to redraw the charts on the fly. So every time anything here changes, it automatically saves the state to the database and uh, updates the entire uh, visualization. So that's uh, one of the benefits. We're actually using the same library in the front and on the back end. Uh, so there's no shimming just to make it work in Meteor. There's none of that stuff. Uh, we can make uh, several different types of charts. So I'll just show you some examples of charts that are run in production. Uh, this is a column chart, screen graph, line charts, multi-line. We're working on other types, but uh, D3 is by far much more complex than uh, Meteor when it comes to how to build this app. Uh, because I, I don't know how many, how many of you have used D3? Just uh, out of curiosity. Yeah. So I'm sure you've all suffered through it, suffered through reading the API documentation, which was written by a genius for other geniuses. So it doesn't <laughs> make any sense. Uh, so very, very painful thing to do, to build a, a DSL on top of D3 to generate all these charts. But we're, we're getting there. Uh, you'll notice that there's a couple buttons down here, uh, PNG and print export. We're just using canvas elements to uh, generate images automatically uh, and then download them. Uh, so you can see, right. well, that's not right. Just to pretend that you can see that. <laughs> Whenever I give this demo, something inevitably goes terribly, terribly wrong. So usually that works. There's a bug that I can't find, I can't figure out with Canvas, where if you have Chrome open long enough, the images are still working. Uh, you can also download a PDF. Uh, this will probably, hopefully, work. Uh, and it'll just download a file that's a uh, size for print uh, and ready to go, uh, kind of. Uh, we drop this into our pipeline and it gets optimized and crunched and uh, turned into C1K and then it's ready to go to the paper. So other things that we're using with this uh, app, we're using our, we're offering uh, rather the archive, like I mentioned earlier. So you can actually take a look at all the charts that have been generated. Uh, you can search through the charts, so you can search for old things and it's full text search for all the fields. Uh, there's also, this, this will probably work, uh, there's also an API endpoint, so I'm just going to change that. 
uh, it'll just return all of the data in the uh, database for that one thing. So you'll see that this is basically, uh, we're describing the chart in JSON form, and that's what actually builds the chart at the end of the day. There's a huge, uh, <laughs> there's a huge string here called image, which is a, uh, this is a, a fun story. Basically, because of our requirements, because of our business requirements, we have a lot of people who still use IE8 who visit the globe. And because of the globe, one of our core readers is business people. We can't just drop support. So when you actually grab the embed code that's going to the CMS, uh, hopefully you guys will find this as funny as I do. This is the, <laughs> this is the embed code. So uh, there's some crap up here just to describe what we're looking at. There's the data, uh, blah, 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 blah. It fires a closure, which then adds uh, stuff into an array, which then gets parsed and drawn on the page. And then you have a base 64 encoded version of the entire chart. <laughs> uh, and you would think this is not performant, but this is, a, this is about 10K. So we figured that was acceptable. Uh, that was an OK uh, thing to have to deal with. It's also hilarious because that means that, ugh, that means that every single time I change anything on this page, Say I want to change Ukraine into Ukraine with two eyes for some reason. It automatically drew a new image, took the base 64 version of that and to the database, which I thought was probably going to melt all the servers, but it was fine. It doesn't really matter, uh, as it turns out. Meteor is fast enough to handle that stuff. So doing a lot of semi-ridiculous things uh, to get these charts to draw. So in terms of things I'm actually using, uh, we're looking at uh, Iron Router, D3, uh, for the front end stuff, and then only a handful of Meteor packages. There's a one called Persistence that I started using recently. Um, I'll show you guys uh, to show people if someone else is editing your chart, because that was a big complaint by editors that things were just popping around and moving around. So if more than one person is editing a chart, they get animal names and it'll tell you who you are and who else is editing your chart. Just so that if something weird starts happening, you know it's not you probably. Uh, what else? Uh, that's actually basically it as far as the demo goes. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any questions about this. I mean, I'll talk. I have a couple more slides, but that's basically it as far as the demo goes. Yeah. What do you use to generate the animal names? <laughs> uh, there's a uh, an animal namer API. Uh, it's on GitHub, so I just cloned it and I run it on uh, my test server, which is probably a very bad idea. Uh, I have a an array of backup names just in case it fails. Uh, but basically. Uh, Iron Router just says, oh, just give me like a couple names just in case, and I have those loaded, ready to go. Yeah? Have you ever considered using something like Tableau or any of the other PI tools to, to build the first? That's an interesting question. Uh, my answer is that Tableau sucks. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I'm, I'm half joking. I think Tableau is very good for certain kinds of people. There's a lot of data journalists that use Tableau, and I think that's great. But in our case, uh, Tableau violates one of our core uh, missions with this project, which was to be on brand. On brand, you mean like the global mail? The global mail style, yeah. Uh, on the web, that's less important, but it still matters to us. Uh, but definitely in print, like if I were to run like a screenshot of a Tableau thing, I would get fired the next day, guaranteed. So it's, a, it's just also not as uh, versatile in some ways as D3 is, because I can, I can write my own indexing function and index all the lines to a certain value, no problem. Like I can do that and add that into Meteor and I'm done, right? So I can, this makes it much more extensible because I control everything. So I have a question, so all the charts we've seen so far have been static. Do you have any need for dynamic? See, that's an interesting question. We're actually, uh, because of the way this embed code works and because of the way uh, D3 actually draws the charts on the page, um, we're actually able to use uh, well, we haven't done this yet because we've had no need to, uh, and I've been too busy making this thing. <laughs> but uh, we're actually talking about integrating this with uh, something like our active on the front end. I don't know if you guys are familiar with our active. It's just like a two-way data binding project by a guy who, a genius who works at the Guardian. Uh, and uh, it's interesting because basically you can say, you know, talk, when you click on this, toggle the data and redraw the chart dynamically, and it'll just do it. So uh, we're actually starting to use this tool to develop custom charts in production. Uh, we'll take the embed code and then manipulate it and write some really hacky D3, which is honestly my entire job, and then uh, deploy it and you know, hopefully everything works and I don't melt the website. Yep. Uh, talking about the two-way uh, two data, data binding, mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, Manuel, which is the MIDI package uh, for Model View in uh, Meteor, and uh, it's wonderful. And uh, Manuel, and um, it's in Denver, Colorado, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a package you should take a look at. I sent me a look afterwards, I'll see it. It, 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 uh, it. it basically does what you get from Knockout or Angular, mm. but it does it with this, this uh, KB, right? So, so it's pretty like, I know you don't know, like a wing, but uh, probably for you, but um, it works right on top of Meteor, and uh, you get the reactivity, uh, plus uh, you can do the two-way binding, and uh, it's awesome. So that's something that's actually worth mentioning. I don't know if, uh, that was clear, but when you actually pull the embed code out and you drop it into our content management system, Meteor's drop is finished. Meteor is no longer a part of this process. Uh, we very specifically made the charts static. Uh, so if you look at the embed code, you'll notice that it has all of the, all of the information qualified in the chart. Uh, you have the data just as a, a string of uh, CSVs with new lines in it. That's it. That's on purpose. Uh, we wanted to make sure that um, if this terrible concoction I made falls apart one day, this falls over. Uh, we don't have thousands, hundreds of thousands of charts on the website, this stop no longer working, because that would be a disaster. And uh, when I was talking to Ops about deploying this, I made it very clear, there, you know, if it goes down, it's not, I mean, it'll still suck, but it's not the end of the world. Like, we won't lose all our charts on the website. Uh, we have to separate those business concerns. So uh, in terms of uh, next steps, we're actually looking at uh, refactoring the entire chart library next, uh, because since we wrote it in seven weeks, uh, it's just, it's honestly, it's like stream of consciousness code at this point uh, that only two people understand. Uh, so my next step is to probably build an inheritance into the, uh, into the, into the three package so that we can actually uh, write more modular code and understand what the hell we're doing. Uh, it's it's not a small library at this point uh, as far as far as D three goes. It's about five or six thousand lines. So my hope is to have that once I have proper inheritance and everything working. Uh, I have some uh, hilarious routing problems that I can't figure out. Uh, sometimes if you download a PDF and then you switch to another page and you go back, it'll try to trigger another download, which is very weird. I don't know why that's happening. Uh, maybe one of you tonight can tell me what the hell I'm doing wrong. I'm not joking about that. Uh, I have no idea how to handle versioning for this thing. So if you actually look at a, we have a version number down here, 1.0.2-16. Uh, and the moment we go to 2.0, this is all going to fall apart. So uh, I'm not really sure how I'm going to handle that yet, but it's something that we have to address soon, or it'll be too late. Um, and the last one is really the big one. We need to add more chart options. We have to add more functionality, but uh, the interface is already pretty busy. You know, you have data options, you have x-axis options, y-axis options, you have styling, uh, set interpolation, all this kind of stuff. That's it's already busy, and people uh, like reporters who are maybe using this for like five minutes on a daily basis do not want that. They'll, it scares them, uh, and uh, it would scare me honestly if I had to learn how to use some asshole tool. Uh, at a moment's notice. So uh, that's the next challenge. We have to figure out if maybe, maybe there's an advanced mode or something like that. And uh, the last one is that we want to open source everything. Uh, it, see, there's a <laughs> there's a joke copyright thing down here right now, but it's uh, we're actually I'm actually hoping to open source this later in the summer. Uh, we're gonna the globe has been very uh, bad so far about not open sourcing anything they do, and a lot of it is because we have uh, proprietary software that we really, we legally can't. But in this case, it's something we built in-house, and uh, there's a bit of a, a chart tool arms race right now uh, between the different uh, newspapers. So The Guardian has one, Quartz built one a while ago called Chart Builder, uh, which is actually, we first looked at that, but then we realized it was only static images, so we said, screw it, we're not doing that. Uh, New York Times has one, uh, and they demoed theirs. Well, I was halfway through building my app and I had to tear it apart and do it again because, uh, of course, it's the New York Times and they, they suck. Um, uh, the, Chicago, the Chicago Tribune has one, the NPR has one. They all, everyone has one now, so I've heard of the CBC picking one. It's just, a, it's just an arms race at this point, and I want to make sure that if we get ours first, then people will start using ours and supporting ours and submitting pull requests, and then I can uh, stop dreaming about uh, interpolation and 
uh, data drawings and that kind of stuff, because that would be great. Uh, but yeah, I think that's, that's actually it. Does anyone have any other questions? That's awesome. Awesome, thank you. And Curtis is going to do a demo. Cool. Sweet. Do I need to use that? You can hear me over there? Uh, I don't know. Can you guys hear me over there? What? Yeah, we can. Uh, yeah, we can. Okay. I talked pretty loud. Okay, okay. All right. You got good. So my name is uh, Curtis Lane, and uh, I'm one of the founders of Castleova. Um, so we recently just soft launched like a couple weeks ago. So basically, uh, the problem we're trying to solve is the rental market is awful right now. You know, people going to GG, Craigslist. Um, you know, everyone has terrible experiences, uh, either with you know fake listings or just you know you don't you don't you're not really able to find exactly what you're looking for where you want it. You know, it's just a big pain dealing with agents. You know, it feels like it's a process that's like firmly stuck in like 20 years ago. And uh, so we're looking to kind of bring that forward. So um, is anyone here like a, a tenant? Who's a tenant? It's actually a lot less than I thought. How about landlords? Wow. So everyone just owns their own house. Okay, that's very interesting. <laughs> Not the crowd I was expecting. Uh, actually, I could have another question about, does anyone here have a like production meteor app that they're running right now? Yeah, a few, cool, quite a few guys. Um, cool, so I'm just gonna basically walk you guys through a demo of uh, what we've built out so far and kind of how we've taken advantage of Meteor and uh, what sort of stuff it's given us and uh, maybe some, some of the challenges we've had as well. Um, so, all right, so like I said, the basics is it's a, it's a rental platform and so the idea is you should be able to find listings on a map, create listings, uh, communicate with your landlord, apply to a place, so basically anything you would need to do throughout the rental process. So if I come in here as a landlord, I can come and check out, cool, this is what we do, you know, it tells you a little bit, you know, just a landing page, not that interesting. Um, so I'm going to log in with Facebook and we get into my dashboard and I'm going to go and I want to create a listing. And so I'm able to go in, create a listing, and here I'm presented with a, basically it's just a form with all the information that you need about the listing. Um, so here's kind of the, one of the first places that we, we started really using the reactivity of Meteor. And we have an edit and a view mode uh, right next to each other. So essentially you're able to edit information about the listing, such as the availability date. Uh, you can see right here it's blank if I add a price and save it, it now updates live, no need to refresh the page. So you're able to just like live see what you're, what you're uh, updating, you know, awesome condo, you can add other stuff, uh, throw in some photos. All right, so you got some photos, save that, um, and it just pops up right here. So. Um, this was really nice, you know, obviously the, this sort of stuff isn't like critical to be reactive, but it's just nice and it costs you nothing. So, you know, it's, it's really cool to be able to throw that in and really, there's literally no cost to it. So I've created a listing, um, here's one that I've already filled out, you know, tells you what you need in order to activate it. So I'm going to activate this listing and it now is going to show up on our map. And so. Here's the map search, you know, you're able to filter by a whole bunch of different stuff. And uh, so I guess here's another, another place where we've taken advantage of the, uh, the Meteor, how Meteor works essentially is that uh, right now we're just passing all of the listings for a given geographical area just to the client and just using the mini Mongo database in the client to actually do all the filtering work for us. So uh, we've offloaded basically all of that off the server. Um, now we're not, we don't have a ton of listings yet, so it'll be interesting to see what happens as we start to scale up. But uh, you know, so far this has proven to work at a, at a small scale, and I haven't, I haven't done like a, you know serious load testing on it or anything either. Uh, but you know, I'm sure we will get to that. So this is essentially what a listing looks like. You know, you can check it out, and uh, maybe at this point I'll flip over to uh, the tenant, so you can go through the rest of the process. 
Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, guys. All right, cool. So maybe I'll full screen this. I guess I should have this full screen. Sorry, I'm used to working like half screen. That's just my workflow. All right, so I'm going to log in as another user. This time I'm a tenant. And uh, you're going to go straight to the map, probably. That's what most people are interested in. And so I search around and find this listing. It looks awesome, and I like it. I'm going to see maybe check out the landlord and see you know about him. Does he have any more listings? Is he like legit? Looks like this guy's got a few listings. So you know maybe he's been around for a while. He has no references or anything, but you know good enough. It's only listing there, so I'm going to contact him. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and contact him, and this brings me into a chat. And again, another thing where like you get this so simply with Meteor, just building out a, a chat. Um, the ability to just say, you know, hey Curtis, how's it going? And if I flip back over to my landlord, there's a notification, right? And throughout the app, it's it's incredibly easy to just build out these notifications because um, they're all just relying on a single collection, automatically updates. Um, so a lot of this stuff you just get, you know, completely for free. You can send me back a message, and you know, I've I've sent a couple messages back and forth. Great, I'm happy about it, and. Uh, I want to apply. So I'm going to go in and make an offer. And uh, so I can see this is definitely the listing I want. I'm going to go for June 1st. Uh, I'm going to offer him a little bit under what he wants. You know, I think uh, I think he's desperate. And uh, he would need my money. So just moving through the process here, I'm able to fill out my rental application. Basically, uh, you know, instead of filling out the paper application for every place that you want to apply to, we store the information. You go through it once. You know, you read residential history, uh, employment history, and obviously, you know, as you go through and use the site, we can start to pull your actual places you've lived uh, from the site. But you know, obviously, being new, we don't have that yet. Uh, review your application. Looks good, and you can submit that right over to the landlord. And get check marks all around. Everyone loves check marks. Can't go wrong. And again, landlord just gets a notification right away. It's live. He's got a new offer on this listing. I can go check it out. See, okay. Here's my new offer from David. And all right, he looks good. He's got a good job. Makes uh, twenty thousand dollars a year. This guy's killing it. He's doing really good. Amazon's um, being cheap. Sorry. Or Amazon's being cheap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so I'm going to accept him into my property, uh, which charges a 1% booking fee. So you go ahead and pay. And great. That goes through. I've accepted a new tenant. Tenant gets a notification, uh, gets an email notification as well that they've been accepted into this property. So tenant can go check it out. Hey, great. Now Curtis, uh, Curtis is now your landlord. So that's awesome. And uh, as Curtis, I can go over here and see that I have a new tenant in this property. Uh, as I check it out, just able to message him, so, you know, maybe tell him how he can come over and sign the lease. Um, so you know, all the all this uh, messaging that's happening live is just like it's so easy to build this out with Meteor. So that is um, that's basically the the process that we have right now built out for um, uh, you know applying to a place. Uh, we have a few more listings here where you can just kind of see how the the search works. So again, you know, you're able to filter based on whatever criteria you want, and this is all happening in the client. Yeah? Do you have a question? Just a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I noticed you, you, you guys are using material on the page. Yeah, the yeah, we are. How long did you guys to put this together? What did you do? How, sorry? How long? How long? So I've been basically the sole developer. I've built like 97, 98% of it in under two months. It's been like seven weeks. Full-time, full time. About seven weeks, yeah. Um, so, not quite full time actually. So, I, I quit my job on uh, April 10th, was my last day, and I, we started March 19th. So, I was like half time for a month and then full time for a month. Uh, so, it's not even two months yet, and we've been able to build, well, just basically just myself. I have a designer helping me with the design. Uh, that's definitely not my strong suit. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, a good question now. Uh, any other cloud services like background check, uh, great history check? Yeah. If you want to plug into this, have you, have you thought about that? Yeah. So I mean, we we have tons of plans, uh, you know, going forward. Uh, mostly, I've just been talking, you know, kind of to the technical 
aside more than kind of the vision of where this is going, but yeah, we plan to integrate, um, you know, background checks, credit checks, you know, we have the social verifications as well as references. So kind of, you know, bringing in better tenant screening features than what's available right now. Um, that's one of the bigger uh, issues that landlords are coming to us with, saying that, you know, they need better tools for tenant screening, getting, you know, a, a past landlord to give them a reference or something. You don't even know if it's legitimate. Um, so just kind of bringing in the tools that we now have available to us, uh, you know, we're trying to leverage all of those. Um, so this is beautiful software. Um, if, if you have, typically a landlord might have somebody call them, and then they need to keep their own records of their own tenants. This, this presumes that each, each tenant is going to come in and create an account and all that stuff. Yeah. Is there some way that the landlord can then create sort of a fake profile for someone that's contacted them that they also want to keep managed along with the rest of the tenant on? A fake profile? Sorry, I'm not following. Sort of like a, like a profile for someone that's contacted you that you want to keep organized with the rest of the, the tenants that are trying to come So you want to know if you want to keep a record of someone who's contacted you? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, we're, we're trying to kind of build in that you're able to, to keep a, a record of, of kind of everything and we're, we're trying to record, uh, you know, everything that goes on in the site. So, you know, right now it's uh, pretty basic, but, um, is that the right one? Yeah. I think it means like if someone contacts you outside. Oh, outside. Okay, got you. So, um, you know, our goal right now is just to kind of try to feed people into the, the site. Um, it's a pretty painless sign-up process, you know, just uh, sign up with Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, it's like a one-click, pretty frictionless sign-up. Um, and so we're really just trying to push people into the tool. Um, right now, you know, one of the problems in the market is that it's so fractured. People are using five, six different listing tools like Gigi, Craigslist, Viewit, you know, they're all over the map. And uh, then there's separate tenant screening tools and none of them really have uh, the full suite of tools that you need in order to you know, put a listing up, find a tenant, screen them. And so we're really focusing on building out all of those tools and just pushing people to record everything into here. Uh, it's a lot more valuable once there's you know, references and reviews that have been built up over some time. So that's where a lot of the value comes from is the social verifications. Um, so you really know who someone actually is that you're talking to, whether it's a landlord or a tenant. Um, you know, it, it's been, uh, so I, before this, I had honestly not done that much in terms of like front end web development. You know, I worked at Amazon, I've done back end stuff, I've done a bunch of Java, I did some iOS, but in terms of like web, I've not really done that much. I've used a bit of Bootstrap. Um, so I found Materialize uh, quite intuitive in terms of uh, a lot of the stuff that it gave me. Uh, it was like, you know, just simple concepts like the cards and stuff were nice, but I found that, you know, I've been really modifying it pretty heavily as we go to kind of work with, we're creating kind of our own style. Um, if I were to start again, like I like it, but if I were to start again, I would almost just take a grid system and build from there. Um, maybe just pull a few components, but I, I'm not really loving, the, the framework is like very opinionated and, and I'm, we're finding that we're kind of creating a mix between sort of some flat design and materialized design and it, it almost would be better to just, you know, build it up from scratch just using a grid. So like Bootstrap sort of thing or? Uh, no, like Bootstrap's also a framework, right? So it, they're both pretty opinionated about kind of how something's going to look. Uh, you can theme them, but like at the end of the day, I find myself kind of fighting against the framework with some of the designs that I want to do. Um, so overall though, I do like Materialize and I think it's great to get started with something. But you know, once you get deep enough into a product and you're not just putting together you know, uh, a couple of pages and you're really building like a whole application with its own design. Uh, and like I say, we have a pretty good designer. Like if it was me just like trying to come up with stuff, I would definitely just stick with the framework and kind of the components that it gives me. But you know, she's awesome and she comes up with things that I end up kind of fighting against the framework to style certain things in the way that I would like it. Can you use but, an example of something that you have to fight against? Um, it's a good example. I mean, Materialize is really like everything is intended to be kind of, it's, it's a pretty immature framework, first of all. So uh, if you compare it to something like Bootstrap, uh, it has a lot less uh, control over what you can change. Like I've basically, like destroyed any chance of like updating materialize at this point. Um, we've had to kind of eat into the source code to, to change things. Um, 
and like everything there is kind of intended to be hovering, like these things that you know come out of the page with depth, and like it's really too much, it's really overwhelming, and so you know I've ended up building kind of flat components to go along with um, the hovering. Like you can see that the you know there's like a top shadow here, there's a side shadow here, we have a card, but then if you start like the buttons by default, they really just have one button, it's one color, it comes out, it has Z depth, and it's like it can be really overwhelming, and it, it just is too much movement on the page. Um, and another thing as well is with me with Materialize, uh, a lot of the JavaScript stuff that they give you, uh, and I don't know if this is maybe just more of an issue with using Meteor, um, but the, the Materialize stuff is not built in like a, a Meteor kind of way, right? And it doesn't clean itself up very well. Um, if you're using the forms, for example, it just like throws a bunch of stuff into the DOM, and this is like kind of intended to be a, it's an app, people don't refresh the page, right? And so everything that gets added into the DOM, if it doesn't get cleaned up, it just keeps adding cruft, right? Um, so there's those sorts of issues that I've dealt with and I've gone in to modify things, kind of, you know, create a template that, that manages it for you. Um, but in doing that, I've had to, you know, modify the, the actual JavaScript libraries for Materialize to make them work, like give them IDs and stuff so I can actually track them. Um, so stuff like that. But overall, I found Materialize has been pretty good though. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Sorry? Edge over Gustav, for example. I, li I find it much more intuitive than Bootstrap. Um, it just like, you know, like I said, I didn't have a ton of experience. I tried to use Bootstrap, it's really popular. Uh, and it was okay, but I just like, I started using Materialize and it just came together a lot quicker for me. Um, and so just to kind of put this all in perspective, we started this back in November-ish uh, and we started building with Python, Django, and, uh, and Angular. And it was progressing at this like snail pace. Um, and you know, we started, I was running into all these problems that I was dealing with like, you know, gulp and like creating a build system and like Yeoman and like trying to find like the best way to build the app. And it's like focusing on all this stuff that's like really not developing the product that we're trying to build, right? And since we restarted March 19th, uh, you know, Meteor just kind of handles a lot of that stuff for you. And you know, you lose a little bit of control in terms of, you know, at, at least because I haven't really tuned it, when things are loaded, you know, we're loading way too many things. Like I load Stripe when they load the landing page, right? Like not the right way to do it. You know, I need to go in and maybe use the iron router to, to manage loading of certain libraries, stuff like that. But overall, you know, it just kind of deals with, you know, packaging it, it deals with loading everything, it deals with building it. There's just, you, you're really able to focus on building your product rather than, you know, finagling with stuff and just kind of getting it to together. So we are using Compose for the database, um, and we're just using DigitalOcean for the the server. Right now, it's just one server, just one server right now. So you should uh, use Compose instead of Compose. That? Compose, they're like hosted Mongo database. Oh. Yeah. So we're just using Compose. So the database is separate from the the server. Um, I don't really want to you know deal with running the database and the replica sets and stuff like that. Uh, it's easier just to pay someone. And I actually originally wanted to use uh, Modulus as well, but I had some trouble getting it deployed there, and I know it's supposed to be super simple, but uh, I switched using Meteor up, and that was way simpler. Uh, it's also cheaper to use DigitalOcean, uh, and I now have a staging server and a production server running on the same server, which for now is all right, uh, running through Nginx just to run things. Um, and it's, it's all been like super simple uh, from that front. So, I am definitely still waiting for Galaxy to come out. I don't know if uh, anyone knows more about what's going on on that front, but uh, you know what, what I have so far with DigitalOcean has worked uh, quite well. So what does it do for image processing? Is image magic or some other service? For image processing? Image resizing? Nothing <laughs> right now. <laughs> we yes. just send them through. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, there, there's, there's absolutely not a single test written for this. Uh, we have no image processing. You know, there, there's tons of holes. Um, at this point, we're we're kind of focusing on building out, uh, you know, features. We kind of have a base feature set that we want to build out. We're getting pretty close to that. And uh, once we hit that mark, we're going to start looking more at the analytics, seeing you know how people are using the product, refining things, adding tests, and uh, you know, just just turning it into more of a, a production quality app. Yep. Are you looking for help? Yeah, we are definitely hiring. Um, if anyone's interested, you know, part time or full time, um, you know, come talk to me afterwards, and uh, we're definitely interested. Hey, I got a couple of questions. Can you hear me? 
where is that coming from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Hey, uh, so uh, good looking app. Um, is this live or is this in for now? Is this local? So yeah, this, this is live. Know. Yeah, it's called Casalova. It's uh, www.casalova.ca. C-A-S-A-L-O-V-A.ca. Uh, it's okay. live right now. You can go on. You can create a listing. You can create an account. You can verify socially. You can request references from your friends. They can come on, leave your references. You can apply to the place. The whole flow that I gave you right now, uh, right up into the point that you you know you have the tenant. You're a tenant. You have the property, or if you're a landlord, you gotten a tenant into your property, you've screened them, that whole process is uh, ready to go, it's live right now. But we're only um, in Toronto at the moment. Okay, okay, so I have two questions for you. Um, one, did you design this with mobile in mind since uh, Meteor uh, 1.0 Plus has Cordova integration? That's a good question. Um, yeah, so yeah. can I answer that first or do you want to give that up? No, yeah, yeah, go ahead. All right, so for the most part, the answer is yes. Uh, we have been designing with mobile in mind. Uh, it's not like, the experience on mobile is not inc incredible, and uh, you know part of it I chalk up to, uh, like I said, kind of loading too much stuff at the start and really not like I I just kind of pulled in a bunch of packages. Um, you know, there's a bunch of stuff people have built. Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. Uh, but I've got a lot of stuff in here. Like I just built up this light box that I showed you guys, and you know I, I brought in a different slider that works better for this, a different carousel, and I have two carousels in here that are both like 200 kilobytes that I don't need, so you know, I have to get rid of one. But um, most of the pages are reactive, so if you scroll in, uh, the sidebar goes away, uh, and you're able to just kind of bring it out. Uh, it actually, is, you can kind of scroll it out uh, with a side swipe, and you know, all the, it uses just a grid system to basically, um, to be responsive. So uh, you know, we've kind of built it out, like these forms, for example, work quite well on mobile because they're all uh, vertical. So they stack, so they work quite well on mobile, and like I said, all the views just kind of stack as well. There's a there's a couple that are not fully built out with mobile in mind. Uh, messaging we haven't got to, so it's just you know three columns. Obviously, you should really just show one of these columns at a time. Um, but you know, even if you're going through the offer flow, you know it's all works quite well on mobile. Um, there's a couple things like on the map. If you're actually on a mobile device and you bring up a listing, it's pretty much impossible to actually click on one because there's a carousel here and it thinks the click is like a drag. And um, so there's there's some stuff that we need to look at, but you know we've been kind of we've had it in mind and we definitely are looking to release it on Android and iOS probably around that time that you know I talked about you know cleaning up, refining things, adding tests. We'll probably look at testing it on mobile and releasing it there as well. So we just have a few pages to kind of clean up and make them really work properly uh, oh. on mobile. Okay, and so the other question is, uh, is that map leaflet? Which map uh, API are you using? Yeah, it's Mapbox. So yeah, they're built on leaflet, I believe. Um, so yes. So is your app handling real-time geolocations? Like, so if you're actually out in some place in Toronto and you pull up your app and you want to see what listings are currently near you, can you do that in your app? Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, it searches based on where you are. So when I add a new listing, uh, geolocates based off the uh, the address that you give it on the server side. Uh, we store that, and then, like I said, you know, as you as you search around, uh, we have a publication that just publishes all the listings in the, the box that you're looking at, and the client deals with the filtering. So you know, you actually look at the search. This is all happening in the mini Mongo on the client. Um, so the only the only thing we get from the server is whether or not it's an enabled listing, whether it's active. Essentially, have you filled out all the fields and then activated it, uh, and then is it within the location that you're looking at? Now, right now, it's like like I said, it's pretty locked down uh, to Toronto because partially because uh, we don't want to go over our quota of Mapbox uh, and we don't have anything outside of Toronto. Uh, and you get charged based on the number of tiles that people load. Uh, but it is yeah, it's all totally live. Uh, I'm sure we're going to run into issues uh, in the future when we have a lot more listings where, you know, the strategy may not necessarily work, you know, if we're loading 10,000 listings um, or, or even, you know, uh, it's, it's the exact grid that you're looking at as the publication and maybe it makes more sense to break them into kind of tiles because, uh, because of the way that the, the PubSub system works. Uh, if you have, 
different dimensions for all of your publications. It's going to be a lot more expensive for your server to track all of them rather than if you know you had set tiles and you were looking at say these ten tiles, you just subscribe to the ten same publications. So you know there'll be a lot of fine tuning to do as we grow, but uh, you know everything we're just kind of building it as as we need it. You know as is the right way to do. You don't want to uh, to design for performance before you really know where the bottlenecks are. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. When you guys cool. set up to sort of like redesign the experience, the whole thing, uh, I just out of curiosity, what product, like how did you go about it? So was it just uh, to design the UI? Well, not the UI, it's more just like the whole experience. User experience, not about like scope, like for example, this mess, the flow, how the, it um, joins, landlord, all that. So it, it's a mixture of things. I mean, we talked to landlords, we talked to client uh, to tenants before we started, uh, you know, and throughout the whole process, we have some advisors, um, and then. You know, like I say, we have uh, our designer is, is very good in terms of you know uh, colors and, and assets and that sort of thing. Uh, my co-founder, who was here earlier, he had to leave for another meeting, but uh, you know he has a pretty good eye as well for just kind of what's going to work. A lot of reading about looking at other sites, reading about you know what good flows are, sort of gamification, and you know it's it's been a process. Um, even in the the short time, like really, I'd say you know since we restarted two months ago. I look back at some of the earlier pages we designed, like the uh, the profile page. So just to give you some contrast. Um, so this is this is like one of the earlier pages. Oh, this is bad. Okay, there's no listing. So um, one of the earlier pages, like the profile page. You know, we we have a bunch of cards here. There's like this kind of profile card at the top. There's these listings. There's also reference cards here. This guy had any references, um, and we've. You know, it can get to be a little bit too much with the cards, right? And uh, so this is kind of one of the older ones we threw together. And then when you go into the listing page, you know, this one's been redesigned recently, and I think at least it's much nicer. So it's just a, pro a process. Of, uh, from, uh, what's it called? Uh, the competitor tool. Eric Beans. Eric Beans. I mean, yeah, I mean, there, there's cues, obviously, right? There, there's trends throughout the internet, and obviously, yeah, we, we take cues from you know, from different people. Um, you know, Airbnb obviously has been incredibly successful in their space, and so we've taken design cues as well as uh, some of the user flows, but you know, there's there's other things as well that we've drawn from. Um, we're just trying to, you know, it. it's an iterative experience, you know, us ourselves growing, learning how to design things, as well as just the web itself. You see trends, you see, you know, people evolving and growing, and it, it happens very quickly, so. You know, we're just taking, uh, trying to take, you know, the best of what's out there, build on top of it, put in our own experiences as well. Um, and you know, th like I say, things have like even within our own design, things have like changed massively. And we're just kind of we build one page, we see how people use it, we rebuild it, redesign it, um, and it, it's a never-ending process. So you know, we take uh, influence from a lot of different places. Yep. Okay. So here the the, the, the question, right? Regarding uh, uh, mobile. Yep. So in today's environment. I think there's a market fragmented, right? And I think you should design mobile first. Mm -hmm. And you should be coming in and saying, okay, well, how do I make this product fantastic? That, and how do I make it feel like you <coughs> make it? Right. And, and a couple of things that you can do from the onset regarding performance. Uh, for example, you use a uh, material line. Are you loading the style sheet separately? Are you using to something like JSS to load them? So that way you have you load it and less less uh, files because Mitchell would load those type sheets separately and on mobile that means they we have to pull for that to load. So so I mean I I haven't looked too much into like I say like I've just Meteor mostly just handles loading stuff. Uh, you know you don't really control load order. Um, there's stuff you can do in terms of like you know only loading like a certain JavaScript like. I wanted to load like Mapbox, for example, you know, loads uh, on demand based on a route. So it goes out to a CDN and it pulls in the Mapbox API when it needs it. But like with the style sheets, uh, yeah, we just load everything. It gets minified, concatenated. You know, Meteor just does that with you get one JavaScript file, one CSS file. Um, and no, I haven't like done anything to really try to improve performance on mobile yet. Yeah, because, because stuff like that, I think that's where the bottlenecks are going to be, mm -hmm. right? So you, like for example, one of the things we're doing in the right, right? Like what you have right now, some, unfortunately, it's cool that you built it, right? But I, I wish you were getting the part of, part of the right, right? 
uh, because you would get, say, 80% of what you, you're doing right now out of the box of the right, right? And there's certain things that we're also trying to add, like, for example, using JSS. I mean, we have packages where you do style sheets, but if you're going to go mobile as a strategy, uh, you want, even if you're using Mapbox, you want to be able to have, uh, take out the style sheet com completely and, and, and move it into JavaScript. Or if you're using coffee, move it into coffee. Mm -hmm. That way, uh, when people are loading this, uh, this app, it's fast, right? You don't have to wait for that. It's right. just the way of the network. Then, then the other thing again, regarding, I, I'm looking at the, the, the image, like you flipping through those photos, right? So, uh, right now, just pure going to dump, dump to, to do that, right? But doing stuff like using it through WebGL, right? Yeah. That means you're using the GPU to mm -hmm. do that. So that means it's incredibly fast. So once you catch up those images, then, you know, so they have that native feel. Yeah, so I mean, I totally agree. Uh, you know, there's gonna be things that need to be done. Uh, at this point, you know, I haven't seen much in terms of what you get out of a Meteor, uh, you know, native, like a wrapped app using Cordova. I think I looked at one today uh, on the, on Android uh, called Brave. There's just a blog on the differential blog. They like got a lot of users pretty quickly. They were able to scale, but like I looked at the app and it's clearly a web app. Uh, I don't know that, like uh, like Chris was saying, I don't know if you can really avoid that. Like at the end of the day, a native app is still significantly better than anything you can make by wrapping, you know, uh, an application with Cordova and kind of packaging it for native. But with that being said, like I said, I'm the only developer for this app and we can conceivably put out an app on three platforms, you know, in the next month. And that's something that, you know, is very difficult or was very difficult to do up until a short time ago. And no, I'm not saying it's gonna be the best experience, but you know, we're very early still in kind of the validation mode, not the, the fine tuning mode. And once we kind of figure out exactly what our customers want and we've nailed down the, the customer validation, and the future set a lot more, then we'll focus on tuning the performance, but I think we're kind of not quite at that stage yet. Fair so I just want to add up to the point that he's trying to make, which is actually like a legitimate point, that if you actually want to use Meteor on a native application, on, uh, like on the phone, using like regular Dome, it will be very slow, yeah. but the approach that he's basically trying to bring up to the group as a whole is if you actually integrate Meteor, with the famous uh, yeah. framework, which essentially means that your entire rendering of your application on your phone would be done using uh, some of the hardware. It right. will actually get very close to the native app performance. The quirks of it is that it's a different way of thinking about how you lay out your, your interface. Right. But on the other hand is that once your application is done and built using famous, you actually will have a, a famous entity or you'll actually have a web app on the phone that has the almost comparable performance to a native app, which you won't have if you just use media on its own right. materializing or bootstrap. I sure. guess that's the, he's, he's been trying to sort of bring this point out to everybody, yeah. and I think it's actually an important thing to sort of like uh, highlight. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I, uh, you know, when I started this, you know, I researched different technologies, started with Django, moved to Meteor, you know, switched things a few times. Uh, I did briefly look at Famous, but, you know, uh, it, it is, like you say, it's very different. Um, and I'm not saying that CSS is great, because I'm sure a lot of you would agree it's not. Uh, it has a lot of serious problems. But, uh, you know, it's very familiar. There's a lot of, uh, you know, packages, frameworks out there, uh, a lot of documentation you know, of, of how it works, and you know, maybe Famous would have been a better choice, but you know, I, I we didn't go that way, and you know, maybe we'll determine that that's the route we have to go in the future, but uh, I really just honestly don't have that much experience with it. And I agree with you in that at your stage right now, you're just trying to validate the idea, so yeah. building as fast as possible is, is, is the best way forward. Um, just as a, just a suggestion, uh, with your images, everything right now just be loaded onto your server, you need to serve from your server, correct? Uh, it's S3, actually. Yeah. Oh you're, yeah, so uh, uh, one suggestion would be to use Cloudinary. Have you heard of Cloudinary? No. They're an image processing service. You upload everything to there, okay. and, and then they do all the processing stuff for you. Just you just use our API, and, and they right. do all the processing. Similar to uh, there's file picker, is that another? Uh, maybe I, I use Cloudinary for one of my projects, okay. and it, it really does help a lot. It saves a lot of time. Do you right. just request so, the, in the URL, do you embed the, the dimensions of the image you want and yep, on yep. the fly? And, and, okay, cool. It, and it just returns everything. Yeah, it yeah. returns it in the WebM format, so it, it really cuts down the size. Of the right, image. cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's I know that's something that, again, when I kind of get to a phase where we've built out a few more features and we need to clean up, that's something we might look at. 
because uh, I know we, we obviously need to do image processing. We can't just be, you know, we're downloading three megabyte, five megabyte images to a phone, multiple of them. That makes no sense.